Good morning. Uh, you may have a uh, motto that you uh, that you live your life you live your life by, uh, or some some theme that you try to uh, follow. Uh, but maybe there's a theme to your life that you didn't choose; it sort of chose you, and you wish that you could uh, you could kick it. Maybe a pattern that you follow time and time again. So I'm going to tell you sort of a pattern that I follow in my life. Not intentionally, uh, but, but, but here's the pattern, and that is, it seems as though throughout my life I've taken the approach which goes something like, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing, right? <laughs> if it's worth doing, then it's worth overdoing. And if you asked me how that's worked out for me, I would tell you uh, not so well. Uh, with varying degrees of success, I've attempted to not just do things, but I've attempted to overdo them. It's sort of how I became a fishing guide. Like, it's just my pattern in life. I, I, take, up, I take up fly fishing while I lived in New Mexico for a few years, but I don't, just, I don't just piddle at fly fishing. I attempt to become really good at it, and then I sort of make a career at it, and that's how I've done things in life. I don't just do them, I overdo them. Uh, there have been a number of things that you might call a hobby. I just will, I'll, I'll try it out for the first time, but then I'll, I'll contemplate, I'll consider, uh, perhaps I could make this a new career. Perhaps this could be a side hustle. Perhaps this is something I could be the best at ever, you know? And so I, I just do that. That's just how my brain works. And I tend to think that's how other people function, but not so much. Some of you totally relate. Some, some of you would say you're, you're just like that. Um, some of you, you, maybe you're married to somebody like me and you think you married a crazy person. I, I, was, outside, I was outside hitting uh, golf balls into this net because, again, if you're going to play golf, you might as well be the best at it. So I'm in my backyard, I'm in my side yard, hitting golf balls into this net a few weeks ago. And my daughter... Emma, who is, is playing golf so now, she came out and I was hitting golf and I, I'm having my, my 10 year old videotape me so I could figure out what's wrong with my swing. I mean, it's like, it's that. So that's just my life. Like, uh, yeah, it's just, the, just, the, it's, just, it's just who I am. So, so I'm trying to figure out how I can become not just okay at golf, but like, like better at golf. And like ultimately, you know, I think I told you a few months ago, maybe I go on the, the senior PGA tour now that I've turned 50. So that's just, so I'm, I'm, I'm hitting golf balls in that and Emma comes out and she's just started playing a little bit of golf and she sat down on the grass. And I started giving her golf instructions, like, you know, how to, how to turn your hips and where the, where the club needs to be at impact and open face and close face. And she says, she says, dad, I, I don't, I don't want a golf lesson. I just, want, I just came out here to watch. And in my mind, I didn't actually say this all, but in my mind, I thought, like, you, you don't want to, like, become better at golf and, like, the best at golf? And, and you don't want to, like, make it your passion? And you don't, like, maybe you're only, uh, you're only 15, or you're 14, almost 15 in a few days. Maybe, maybe you could make the LPGA Tour one day. You don't want any of that, you know, in my mind. And, and her answer, her answer would be no, you know, and I would say, how weird. Like, because that's, that's just how my brain works, and so I don't understand when your brain doesn't work like that, right? Like, that you don't just, like, want to take everything to its final degree. You don't want to just, like, go hard after everything, right? That sounds good. But when it, when it, when it, when I, when I try and live that life, sometimes it's very broken. It's a very broken way of living. We've been talking the last, this is the third week. It's kind of a mini-series. Next week, we're going to start a new series. We've been talking about this over the last few weeks. I think it's a good way for us to begin the new year and sort of recalibrate who we are and, and where we're headed personally, individually, private in life. I said to someone, said to someone uh, just last Sunday, I said, really, for me, Sundays are about us collectively and individually like recalibrating our lives. Like we're, we're kind of, we're, 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 we're running a foul. We're, we're kind of heading the wrong direction. And Sundays are about us kind of correcting our course. Well, that's kind of what this series is about. Have you ever had 
um, an embarrassed, this, this, this embarrassing experience where you, you started out on something that's good, but then you press it too hard. You expect too much of it. You, you, you want too much out of it. You take a good thing and, and you make it an ultimate thing and then it just, it just goes awry. If you can relate to that, and many of you can, if you can relate to that, you know it's embarrassing. That, that has played out in my life at times in front of my, my wife and kids and it's, it's embarrassing. I feel foolish when I take something that's good and I make it ultimate. Years ago, years ago I presided over, over a, a, a wedding uh, of a, a young lady who had wanted to be married for a long time, which is a, a beautiful desire. It is a good thing. And about nine months later, I asked her how marriage was going. And she said, you know, marriage is good. She says, but I remember back to when I was single and I didn't realize how good that was too. And we discussed how in her, um, in her uh, single days, she had taken something good and in her mind she had made it ultimate. And now in marriage, she was sort of correcting her course. She was recalibrating. She was realizing that there are good things but when we make them ultimate things, they really break. No, no one or no thing can, can handle that, that weight that only God can, can handle in your life. When he's the ultimate thing, you can pile all sorts of weight and all sorts of expe expectation on his back and he is able to sustain that weight because he is God. Anyone else, anything else, it just is, it's crushed under that sort of a load. So I've done that to a lot of things. To my wife, to my kids, to my job, to my hobbies. I've piled these heavy weights on them. You will make me happy. You will fulfill me. You will complete me. And it just breaks every time. It's just this ethic of the universe. How God, is, how God has, has uh, formulated or designed this universe. So, so last week we, this is all just still kind of review, last week we looked at James chapter 4. And we're not going to look at it again today, we're going to look at some new passages, but, but let me just remind you, or maybe you weren't here, you can go watch the, uh, the sermon online. Um, James chapter 4, it, it paints this picture of, of desires that we have that are unmet dreams and passions that we have that burn within us and yet they're unfulfilled. It paints this picture of us being a covetous people, meaning we want what others have. We want what we don't have. Maybe you can relate to that. And, and it paints this picture of us having but not wanting what we do have. So, so we're a people who, who, who want what we don't have, don't want what we do have, and so we're fighting, <clears throat> it says we're killing, not literally, but we're killing people with our hateful thoughts, and we're wrestling, and we're struggling, and we're frustrated, and James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, James says, says, here's your problem. You lack a friendship with the Lord. You have a friendship with the world, and you're lacking a friendship with God. You can't have it both ways. It's either one or the other, but it, you can't be both a friend of this world and a friend of the Lord. And, and last week I explained that James is not saying that we shouldn't have non-Christian friends, and we shouldn't engage our, uh, the world and, 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 and be a part of our neighborhood association and be a part of our public schools. He doesn't mean that at all. In fact, I embrace all that stuff. Some of my closest friends are unbelievers. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is a real relief to me. What James is saying, hey, Pastor Randy, in your, in your frustrations, like, like wanting and not having, having a 
deep level of desire for satisfaction, for completion, um, for, 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 for prosperity, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for, for leaving a namesake or a legacy, like all those deep level uh, desires that, that you have, Pastor Randy, uh, J James is saying this to me and he's talking to you too. He's saying, that's not your problem. I want to be clear, as James is clear, our problem is not our desires. Our problem, our problem collectively, individually, is not that we want too much. We want to, we, we want to be married, and we, we, we want to be successful, and we want to be prosperous, and, and we want to be good at what we do, and we want to leave a legacy. James says, that's not your problem. And for me, that's good news, because I want to be a person of passion. I kind of, I kind of want to be a person who overdoes things, you know. I, I, I really want to be a person who runs hard to the, to the tape, to the, to the end of the race. I, I, I want to be a, I want to be a passionate person. And James says that's not your problem. Your problem, James says, is your source, your, your, your source of inspiration, your source of energy, your, your, who you're looking to uh, in, 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 as you model, as you, as you set your course. Is you're, either, you're either a friend of the world and you will, you will forever be dissatisfied and your desires and your passions will, will forever be unmet or you can be a friend of the Lord. So today we're going to go a little deeper and say, what does that mean? It's not that Jesus wants me to check my desires at the door. It's, 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 it's not that Jesus wants me to cool my jets when it comes to my passions and my desires. No, no. So what is it? What does it mean to be a friend of the Lord? Just a little more review, and then we're going to go into some new, new material. Um, last week, I, I, I gave some, some ideas, uh, some action items. I wonder if you considered any of these this week. Listen, if, if I'm honest, we start a new year, I have really been struggling uh, with the stuff that I'm preaching today. Like, when I was driving here to work this morning, I was like, I don't even know if I'm worthy to preach this sermon because, like, this has been kicking my tail this week too. But what I've been doing is I have been drilling down deep with these action items saying, I believe if I set this course the Lord will honor it. The Lord will bless me as I set this course. So here are the action items. I put them before you this week. I've been really trying to take them serious this week myself. How do I become a friend of God? I, I said, uh, number one, regularly engage in prayer. You know, you, you, you know, because I tell you about it, that I often go on walks, long walks, and I, by myself, and I pray, and I talk to the Lord, and sometimes out loud, and sometimes silently, and sometimes it's just groaning. Sometimes it's just, it's just sorrow or, or joy that really isn't accompanied by words. I just, I go on, I go on and pray. And, 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 um, and in those moments, I feel as though I'm becoming more of a friend of the Lord. You know, I wrote, I wrote something down. What? What does friendship with anyone mean? And, and I wrote, you know, friendship, it happens when we, when we go on a journey with someone, figuratively speaking, like a, like a long walk, like a long walk in the same direction, like a long walk toward the same goal. That, that's really what friendship is. Like you, if you and I say uh, that we're friends, but we're not on the same page, and, and we're not really walking in the same direction, and we're not really walking toward the same goal, then we're not really friends. My, my wife and I, we're, we're the dearest of friends. She's my closest friend. And, and we've been on almost a 30-year walk in the same direction, toward the same goal. That's a fr that, that, That's friendship. So I, I think it's kind of sweet that, that, that my friendship with the Lord involves an actual walk from time to time. You know, way back in the Garden of Eden, they spoke of, of, of how, how Adam and Eve would, 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 would walk with the Lord in the Garden. So the action item that I that gave you, one was to regularly engage in prayer, and the second was 
regularly engage in scripture reading. This is, it's not too late. If you want, if you want to decide uh, 2020, it, it's the year for me to read the Bible or the year for me to read the New Testament. You know, if you want to do that, I can, I can provide you some resources like a, a table, a, a chart. I'm following one this year. Uh, if you want that, uh, Miss Lydia, my wife, will be at the welcome table. We can give you some ideas or some websites. I know plenty of resources. If you decide 2020, we're, we're just a few days into January. That's what I'm going to do. In 2020, I'm going to read through systematically a portion of the Bible. We're talking about how can I engage friendship with the Lord. Too long I've been a friend of this world and it's just, it's just so unfulfilling. How can I be a friend of the Lord? Number one, regularly wage war on sin. All I'm really going to say is, is uh, last week I spoke of embarrassing your sin to death. What I mean by that is shaming your sin to death. What I mean by that is, is not protecting the anonymity of your sin. Shedding light on it. Telling your closest, and you have to use wisdom here, but telling your closest friends of your sin. Exposing it so that it might be embarrassed, that it might be shamed to death. Does sin have a life in us that, can, that we can actually embarrass, that we can actually kill? Yes. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Romans that we can kill our sin. We can embarrass it, shame it to death. And one of the ways that we do that, one of the main ways we do that is we live in... in we live in community. We're not too embarrassed to, to tell others, look, I want to kill this sin. I want to shame this sin. I want to embarrass it to death. And so that was the last action item. Regularly seek help from Christian friends. Next week we're going to be telling you more, but, but starting in February, we're going to roll out our, our community nights once again. That is, a, that is an awesome way for you on Wednesday nights to come and, and get to know people at River Church and create some community for you. But it's got to happen on these regularly, regularly scheduled in-between times as well. When we're not coming here on Wednesday nights, who are you spending time with? Who are you getting together with as a result of these friendships that you make on Wednesday nights when we are together for community night? Have you considered any... For all of these action items. I'm going to leave them up there just a second longer. Maybe you want to, I don't know, take a picture or something and, and consider this week. That's going to be 2020 for me. I'm going, to, I'm going to be serious about this in 2020. Let me ask you. If you're on a journey in life, and we all are, if you're headed somewhere, and I certainly hope that you are. I certainly hope, and you hope, I certainly hope you've got some destination in mind and, and you are headed in that direction. And I hope it's a destination that's going to take you a while. In other words, I hope it's a big dream. Like you're not going to get there tomorrow or, or next year. It's going to take a while. Now, now think on this. If, if, that is, if that is life... If you're on a journey in life, and if somehow I could give you the assurance that you're going to make it there, and I, I can't, I don't know, I don't even know what journey you're on, but if, 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 I, if I could, if you had the assurance that you will make it to your destination in life, but God's not going with you, would you still embark on that journey? And... and and of course we wouldn't. We, we want to go where God is headed. We want God to go with us when we go. And, and the fact is, Scripture assures us that if we are friends with the Lord, He directs our path. He reorders our desires. He will set for us priorities. There's this phrase that we use <clears throat> in the church all the time, and we use, rightfully so. It comes, 
It comes out of uh, Scripture. It says, oh God, oh God, give me the desires of my heart. Oh God, give me, give me the desires of my heart. I ask you today, have you ever considered what that might possibly mean? That's a good question. Every one of us, every one of us, I mean, in fact, the bulk of our prayers are just that, right? God, give me, you know what I desire, give me what I desire. Give me what I want. Uh, or, or our prayers involve just telling God of our desires as though he doesn't already know. I want this, you know, in size medium, a color red. I want, you, this is, these are my desires, God, which you give me the desires of my heart. The, 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 the phrase he uses that we, that we often, the, the biblical uh, sentence that, we, 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 that I'm talking of is this. Well, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, it sounds like a formula, and I'm going to suggest that it's not a formula. But if it were a formula, then what would every one of us uh, be smart to do? That is somehow figure out how in the world can I delight myself in the Lord? Because, whoo if I delight myself in the Lord, he's going to give me what I want. Oh, that this would work with God. Oh, that this would work with, with your spouse, with your boss, with your parents. Oh, that there would be a formula that would work out this way. Psalm 37 is where this comes from. Let's look at the whole psalm. It says, don't worry about the wicked. Don't envy those uh, who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Now, now based on our conversation last week and this week, if we, if we had one phrase um, that, could, that could mark that first those first two verses, verses 1 and 2, the phrase would be friendship with the world. I mean, we took that, I took that phrase out of James chapter 4, but it's really talking about the same thing here. The psalmist is saying, this is what friendship with the world looks like. The, the wicked, the wrong, those who will one day fade away, those, those who, like, 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 like flowers and grass, will just wither, says, don't worry about that. Don't, don't worry about, about imitating them. Don't, don't, don't worry about uh, how the, the wicked seemingly get away with everything. Don't be a friend of the world. And then he goes on, he says, this, this, is, this is friendship with the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. And here's the verse that I'm talking about. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. So I ask you, and if you've been an astute Bible studier, you've probably considered this before. What does that mean? Because I, I want that. That, that sounds, whatever it means, in several different iterations, several different possibilities, whatever it means, like I, I want that, 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 I, that, that God would give me my heart's desires. Now, does God give us what we desire? Or does God give us the desires that we have? I mean, you, you see that, you, you understand where I'm, where I'm going. Is he going to just look at what I desire and say, I'm going to give Randy that because that's what Randy wants? Or, or is he going to give me the want? Is he going to reorder my desires? And, and I think a really fascinating question is, which would be best? Would it be better if God just gave you what you wanted? Or would it, be, would it be better if he gave you the want? He reordered your desires and then he met those desires. Think on that for a moment. If God just, just gave you what you desired, and you're like, that's good enough, that's all I wanted anyway, and you walked away, would that ultimately be happy? Would that ultimately, would you ultimately attain the satisfaction you're looking for? Now think on the other scenario. What if he gave you 
passions and desires, and then he met those passions and desires. In that scenario, would you walk away satisfied and happy? What if he merely gave us our desires? Like just gave us what we want. Now, if I don't want to be a, a friend of the Lord, verses 1 and 2, if I don't want to be a friend of God, then I settle for being a friend of the world, and then I'm merely okay with, with, with God placating whatever desires I come up with. Whatever desires uh, I have in my own mind, just give me what I want, God. I don't care what's good for me. Just give me what I want. But you know, a friend won't do that. Like if you're a friend of the Lord or a friend of anyone else, they won't just placate your desires and just give you what you want. To heck with what's good for you. Just give you what you want. No friend does that. Almost 20 years ago, um, Lydia and I, in Albuquerque, uh, we were considering a, a home remodel. We were in a fairly small home, and, uh, you know, it only had one, gar one car garage, you know, and, and, and weren't enough bedrooms for everybody, and, you know, so of course, what do you do? You remodel your house, right? So I spun up this desire, or this, this idea, you know, the, and I became quite passionate about it. And, and, and it, the weird thing was, like, I wasn't sleeping well at night. Like, I, in, I knew it wasn't a good idea, but it's what I wanted. I knew it didn't make any sense, but it's what I wanted. And, and my, my closest friend uh, told me, like, Randy, like, how much is it going to cost? Like, in, in the neighborhood you live in, that's probably not a good idea, but I didn't care. That's what I wanted. But then an older man, I think my younger friend, uh, Dave, called my older friend, Lyle. And, and, and so my older friend, Lyle, I was driving to work one day, and he calls me, and he's like, I hear you thinking about doing a remodel in, you know, in, in your neighborhood. And this, like, yeah, well, I'm thinking about doing that. He's like, yeah, Randy, you're not going to do that. You know? and, then, and then he explained to me why that wasn't going to happen. And he explained to me what would be a better idea. And he, with, with an appropriate sense of authority, I mean, I was the pastor. He was, he, was the, uh, he was the member, but he spoke with authority into my life and said, don't do that. Instead, do this. Because he was a friend. He wasn't, he wasn't merely willing to placate my wants. He wanted to reshape my desires that I might ultimately be fulfilled in that. And I slept better from that day on. So here's the thing. There is a different state of being for the child of God. There's a different, there's a different way to exist as a friend of the Lord. The friends of God have their desires shaped by God first and then met by God second. We do this as parents all the time. Boys, my 10-year-old, he has decided that he wants to play baseball. And he's become pretty passionate about baseball. And I think that's awesome. And so I want to help him in his endeavor to, to learn more about baseball, son. If you're going to do it, you might as well overdo it. Okay. So so we've been you know we've been we've been looking at gloves and 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 bats and and stuff that the team will probably probably uh, provide anyway. But like you might as well get your own, right? And 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 he as he's looked at some items, he's thought maybe I want this item. But I know, because I don't know a lot about baseball, but I know a little bit about baseball. Like, yeah, that's more of a, of a kid's helmet. You need to get a, a better helmet. Or, or, oh, that's too big. Or that's not the appropriate. And I, I'm, I'm, he, he knows what he wants, but I'm helping to reshape his desires. But get, get, guess what else I'm doing? I'm meeting those desires. I'm purchasing what he wants. 
I am providing an opportunity. I'm not merely placating his, the, his, his desire at every whim. I'm helping him figure out what's best for him. And then I am meeting those new recalibrated, so does, uh, recalibrated desires. And by the way, this doesn't mean any less prosperity or any less joy or, or, or or, or any, it, it doesn't mean that our passions are dulled or that God comes along and says, no, no, you, you want too much. Like, don't, do, let's just settle for a little. Let's be, let's be reasonable. That's not how God is. It, in fact, it means heightened joy. It means heightened prosperity that is aligned with God's plans and purposes for eternity. Look at this, um, this next verse, and I want you to, I want you to guess, don't, don't say it out loud, but guess who might have wrote, might have wrote this. Don't, don't say it out loud, you may know, but kind of, for you've given him his heart's desire, you have withheld nothing he requested. This is, a, this is a formal, poetic way of writing in which the author is speaking of himself, but he's, he's speaking, um, speaking in third person. The he is really the author. You, you have given me my heart's desire. You have withheld nothing I requested. And the answer, who wrote this, is, is King David. King David wrote all this stuff that we're reading today about delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now you want to talk about somebody who didn't have to settle. He was king. He made it into the Bible. Um, this, this idea of, of, of delighting ourselves in the Lord, of, of making him uh, our uh, priority in friendship of, of following him rather than the world. This is not a story of, of settling, of, of just saying, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take what's good enough. Uh, I'm going to reorder and, and settle my desires and my passions down and, and live on some, some low grade level of desire. No, no, there's perhaps not a, a, a more passionate person in the Bible than, than the king of Israel, King David. And he said, you've given me my heart's desire. You have you've withheld nothing that I have requested. But this was after a life, this was, this was based on a lifetime of him reordering his priorities, screwing up royally, and then reordering his priorities, recalibrating his thoughts, and, 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 and reestablishing his friendship with the Lord. His story, you recall, he's an, he's an obscure shepherd boy. Maybe, maybe you don't know this, but, but he wasn't always king, of course. Uh, he, he wasn't, like King Saul, King Saul was, was, was a man above, above boys. And he was taller than everybody else, and he was more handsome than everybody else. And he had a fatal flaw, King Saul. And that was, he, he, he was afraid. He was a fraidy cat. He, he struggled with fear. But King David was a little different. He was probably a pretty good-looking guy, but, but, but he was an obscure shepherd boy. He was, he was the youngest of the brothers, such that when the prophet came looking for the next king, they, they, they left uh, little, little uh, David, shepherd boy, out of the equation because he's the little boy. He's the, little, he's the kid brother. Uh, he was from the tiniest backwater town of, of Bethlehem. But he decided to be a friend of the Lord. He decided that friendship with God was better than friendship with the world. And God gave him the desires of his heart. And it included a lot of good stuff. In, King's, in King David's life, it involved a lot of livestock, a lot of gold, 
And, and, and the life of royalty... And, and, and for some of us, God has determined a beautifully joyful life in which we'll live very low to middle income sort of lifestyles. And, and for some of us, God has, has designed for us this, this beautiful life that's going to involve more stuff. And it's really not about that. It's not about more stuff. It's not about less stuff. It's about saying, God, I want to be a, your friend, and I want you to reorder my desires, reshape my priorities, and then meet those desires, those passions. Give me, O oh Lord, the desires of my heart. My, my, my main point here is that God isn't in the business of holding out on you. If you believe that, then, then, then you are not squaring your life with the Bible. Uh, listen, listen to that, friends. If you somehow believe that God is holding out on you, and, and, and I understand how you can get there. But if you believe that, then, then your thoughts, your beliefs are not square with the Bible. Here's uh, one, more, one more psalm today. Psalm 1. I, I've been thinking... Um, meditating on the last two weeks this picture of of a tree let's say a grove of trees let's say every one of us you're a tree and I'm a tree this grove of trees and we're we're firmly planted meaning our roots they're they're sunk down deep and we're by we're by a, a source of water. We're by a, a riverbank. And we are drinking and we are receiving what we need. And, and what is happening is uh, uh, because of that, we are flourishing. We are prospering. We are very much fruit. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. There it is again. Friendship with the world. Oh the joys of those who do not follow. The advice of the wicked. Again I have lots of friends. Who are. Wicked. I don't take their advice. Love them to death. Joy going fishing with them. I don't seek their counsel. Because my friendship is with the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or, or join in with mockers because all that, that would be friendship with the world. No, but in contrast, but they, they delight in the law of the Lord. They, they meditate it. They meditate on it day and night. They are like, here it is, trees planted along the riverbank. Bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither. And they prosper in all that they do. Now friends, as we move into 2020. That is my desire for you. That you would prosper in everything that you do. But, but the fact is, that doesn't even matter. I mean, I, I want that for you because I love you. But, but what really, really matters is, that is, what the, that's what, that is what the Lord wants for you. He wants you to prosper in all that you do. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. He wants to, to withhold nothing that you have requested. Lyle, Lyle, the, the fellow that I told you, the older man who spoke into my life, um, told me I wasn't, in fact, going to be doing a, a home remodel. Lyle, uh, Lyle McDaniels. When I tell bad stories about friends, I don't give their last name, but this is a good story, so I'll give you his last name. Lyle McDaniels. Uh, I've said this before to you. I've, I, I talk, talk about Lyle probably 
once a year. Lyle McGano is just the most generous person I've ever known in my life. L Lyle and his sweet wife, Gail McDaniels, they've gone through seasons of plenty and they have gone through seasons of want. Gone through seasons of plenty, gone through seasons of want. Um, Lyle is, is a highly respected businessman. Lyle has seen two businesses as a very successful and a very shrewd businessman. He has seen two businesses fail. Um, Lyle is once again prospering and, and successful. And, and that's not even the point. The point is he is the most generous and they are the most generous couple I've ever known. When we planted what then was a City on a Hill, now North Church in Albuquerque, um, the, the amount of, 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 of money and, and time uh, and, and, and sweat that they put into seeing um, then City on a Hill grow and prosper so that, so that it's there to this day and they're still there too. We left, they're still there. Without them, I don't know that that church would be there. God has given them the desires of their heart. Through seasons of failure, <clears throat> through, through seasons of success, what has marked their lives. They've been a friend of the Lord. And the product of that has been this, 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 this beauty of generosity. We're closing out this series. Um, we're finishing today and um, we are moving into next week we begin a new series. It's called A, a Generous God. I am going to, to preach um, with more uh, intensity, more, more passion and more detail than I ever have over the last seven years of River Church. I'm going to be preaching on generosity. And it's all born out of the heart of God. Many of us are not generous people because we do not believe, we are not convinced that God is a generous God. We think God is stingy and God is holding out. And why would we give to the Lord or anyone when God is not giving to us? So, so this whole idea of of, of, of God being a generous God comes out of this Psalm 1 passage. You're like a tree and, 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 and your, your, your roots they sink way down deep and, and you're drinking from this source, this, this stream and, and what is the source? Rather, who is the source? source? It is the Lord God himself and you are a friend of the Lord and, and your roots uh, they sink down deep and he is nourishing you and, and what is the end result? Your leaves don't wither. Your life flourishes in all that you do, you prosper. A generous God. I look forward to going there over the next few weeks with you. Let's pray.